I'm Catherine Pompilio, Associate Editor of Lawfare. Today, September 11th, 2022, is the 21st anniversary of the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks in New York City, Arlington, and Shanksville. To commemorate that tragic day 21 years ago, the Lawfare team decided to cross-post an episode of Chatter from January 2000, 2022, entitled 9-11 Memorialization with Merida Sturkin. In the episode, David Priest sat down with Sturkin to discuss 9-11-related memorials, museums, and architecture, as well as Sturkin's work addressing memory of the 9-11 attacks as both the battleground and the site for negotiations of national identity. This is Chatter. Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. In this bonus episode, Professor and author Marita Sturkin on 9-11 Memorialization. How to arrange names is just a huge dilemma for memorial designers. That's part of why the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is chronological from when people died, because an alphabetical list turned those who died into statistics. The desire to focus 9-11 on that one day, which is really evident in, in the museum, is, is really problematic. We're offered very little to help us make sense of why it happened and also what happened in its wake. And then we exit to the gift shops. Marita, thank you for coming on Chatter and talking with us about 9-11, memorials, cultural memory, all of these issues. Well, thank you for having me. You bet. I'm really interested in looking at some things that many of us in the national security community have looked at from our traditional ways, but looking at it through a new lens. And that's that's what you bring to the table here. And I and I'm hoping you can give a little bit of background on yourself for how how it makes sense that we would be talking to somebody who is an expert on media, culture, communication, uh, societal memories, and memorialization. How is it that somebody who focuses on that comes to be centrally involved in issues of of terrorism and its reflection in the public memory? Yeah, so I guess my point of departure would be that... uh, when we're looking at memory, and I would use the term cultural memory to talk about a lot of what I look at, uh, we are often looking at how nations memorialize conflicts and wars, right? And so the fact that this book is really about how we have memorialized terrorism uh, really tells us something uh, about this era of Mm -hmm. Uh, American history. And, mm-hmm. and I should just say from the get-go that I I framed the book to be about uh, the sort of looming shadow of 9-11 memory and, the, and how that has um, been so powerful in what I call the post-9-11 era. But I also end the book by looking at the lynching memorial, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, that opened a few years ago, to talk about how that memorial wants us to think about the history of racial terrorism in the United States and to question our broad public understanding that terrorism is a foreign force that comes from elsewhere uh, to threaten our nation, uh, that in fact, actually, we as a nation have often engaged in acts of terrorism. And so I wanted to use the lynching memorial to signal that actually debates about memory have shifted a lot uh, in the last few years, including debates about Confederate monuments. And so to me, that provides a way of thinking about this as an era and an era that has now ended. And the book you're referring to is your literally hot off the presses (laughs) new book, Terrorism (laughs) in American Memory, Memorials, Museums, and Architecture in the Post-9-11 Era. But it it builds on your your earlier work, Mm -hmm. uh, often published in books like Mm -hmm. Tourists of History and Tangled Memories, but but also plenty of of articles and presentations. So talk a little bit about that 
previous work. What mm-hmm. what is the study of cultural memory, and how did it bring you to these issues of 9/11 and post 9/11 memorials? Well, I began actually when I was in uh, graduate school at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in the late 80s, early 90s. I began to be interested in the question of of memory, and that was in part because there were two very unusual memorials that were really the focus of a lot of attention at that time. And the first was the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which had opened in 1982. And the second was the AIDS quilt. Mm. And I was very interested in how looking at the debates about those memorials, we may forget now that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was subject to an extraordinary debate before it opened. It was quite was, controversial. I mean, yes. uh, the idea of it, the of course, the design of it, mm-hmm. the the various you know constituencies that had mm-hmm. equities related to it, having different interpretations of both of those. Yes, and and it was so embraced upon opening, and so embraced by the veterans that that we've forgotten that it it challenged us to think about memorials in a, in a different way on on the National Mall. You know, it was it was dug into the ground, it's black, it's this reflective black granite, right? It and whereas traditionally, of course, monuments and memorials on on the mall have been tall and white marble and towering and 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 so I was also interested in the fact that that memorial, and this has only been proven more over time, set into motion a kind of memorial culture in the United States that really had not existed previously. The post-war years uh, of American history were not that interested in memory. You know, we were the victory culture, we were moving on, and Vietnam was such a challenge to notions of national identity, to American empire, to our capacity as a nation, to to win wars, that it demanded a very different kind of engagement with what it means to remember and and how we remember as Mm -hmm. a nation. And I would say for all of my work, uh, the primary question is really not about memory so much as it is about how looking at these debates about memory, who gets to be remembered, who isn't remembered, Mm -hmm. what that tells us about how we negotiate our sense of the nation and national identity. Now, this is a a field I'm new to, so I'm going to ask you some Mm -hmm. questions that will probably take you back to uh, an undergraduate class you were just running, right? Because I think some (laughs) of these questions will be very fundamental to you, but very crucial for me Mm -hmm. and maybe some of our Mm -hmm. listeners for providing context. So you set set the Vietnam Memorial uh, apart from things that had preceded it in many ways Mm -hmm. because... Uh, of some of those issues you just mentioned. And it seems to me, maybe there's something else here that a lot of memorials in the United States, but even through history before then, were uh, celebratory or triumphal. And I'm thinking of even back to Trajan's column in Rome. Mm -hmm. But you could say the Washington Monument, the Jefferson Memorial, even the Lincoln Memorial in some ways have some sense of of majesty, of of triumph, of remembering something great that happened and calling attention to that greatness through the architecture and design. The Vietnam Memorial seems a little bit different because it was not meant to celebrate the Vietnam conflict as a pure triumph. It was meant to recognize more explicitly than those that I have just mentioned, um, the, the sacrifice and the cost. And of course, the the Korean memorial um, has some similar, although different, but some similar aspects. And I'm wondering if you can place that in that larger historical context of across centuries and millennia, going back to the Romans and other cultures, (laughs) have, have memorials always been primarily triumphal or have have they been a blend of of triumph and if you will a sense of the tragic as well 
I would say throughout history, we have to make a distinction between monuments, which are triumphal and often mm-hmm. done in a victorious mode, and yeah. memorials. Right? Okay. The, the labor that memorials do tends to be much more um, about loss and rather than being honorific. So if we look at the Washington Monument, right, it's not mourning Washington. It is this, you know... Uh, obelisk that is about affirming him as this primary figure in in American history. And so a lot of the, and I think that as Americans, we often forget that the the National Mall is actually a very unusual national space in Mm -hmm. the global context, right? Mm -hmm. I've often had people from other countries say to me, you know, we don't have something like that, right? <laughs> Even people from London say they don't have something right. like that. And it is such a nationally symbolic space. It was designed to be that. So so when we go to the mall, whether we go as citizens or we go as protesters, mm-hmm. there is a sense that we go there to speak to the nation, to visit the nation, to, right. to be in the nation in its most symbolic place. And so that does include, in addition to a lot of museums, it includes uh, quite a few monuments. And then really, um, we had the Lincoln Memorial. It's a very interesting kind of hybrid because because it's kind of monumental, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it really is a memorial to uh, a president who was struck down while in office, right? Uh, but a lot of the memorial building on the mall is post Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and and I think that's really important to reflect mm-hmm. on because once that memorial became a site of kind of emotion and affect, where where people would go to mourn and veterans would just haunt the place, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there was this sense of other vet- amongst other veterans and other groups that they were being left out. And memorialization often has that effect, right? Mm-hmm. Where uh, once someone is memorialized and someone else wants to be um, uh, immemorialized as well. So all these wars that had taken place earlier, the mm-hmm. Korean War, I mean, we have a World War II yeah. memorial that was opened in 2004, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. which is absurd if you think about it, right? I mean, it was not, it did not appear to be necessary before then, right? right. And it's in part because of this, what we, we call in, I would say, in the sort of small field of memory studies, the memory boom, um, that uh, there was this constant demand for in building of memorials. And that's really just... interesting because there's such a confluence of factors right around that time. Of course, mm-hmm. there's 9-11 itself and mm-hmm. the spur, and we'll talk much mm-hmm. more about that. But obviously there had been the experience of the Vietnam Memorial in mm-hmm. the preceding years mm-hmm. and then the su- subsequent memorials. But also that's around the time when uh, I think we were peak the greatest generation narrative. Mm-hmm. And Tom Brokaw, I think, already had come out with his work on that. Mm-hmm. And you were starting to have a lot of the the stories about the World War II veterans who were were dying. And right. there, there weren't enough left. And do we need to honor them while they're still alive? And I think that all mm-hmm. combined, the, mm-hmm. the cultural memory boom you're talking about, mm-hmm. hitting along with mm-hmm. that raw demographic that right. spurred the World War II memorial to get up relatively right. quickly once they decided, yeah, we're going to move forward on this. Oh, yeah, because they basically bypassed all of the processes that would yeah. normally weigh in on it. And, mm-hmm. and it is a very aesthetically conventional mm-hmm. uh, memorial. I mean, to say that uh, World War II hadn't been memorialized is, of course, absurd. Um, you know, we've been talking about World War II and we've memorialized it in popular culture as well as in many smaller mm-hmm. Uh, more localized memorials. So I, I do think that there it was about why isn't it on the National Mall, this hyper symbolic right. space, right? So the memory boom, you know, there's been a huge amount of memorial building since the 1980s in Europe, uh, in Latin America, even in Africa. Uh, and and each, the sort of motivation in each context 
of grappling with particularly violent events of the 20th century can vary quite a bit. In Latin America, a lot of the memory projects are about the um, um, the, the juntas and the dictatorships right. and the disappeared, yeah. and, and yeah. a lot of them are really aligned with human rights and things like that. I think in we have a very particular version of this in the United States, and it really does begin with this war, the Vietnam War, that disrupts our comfortable narratives about who we are uh, as uh, a, a nation. And I, w- I would just note, so the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, one of its most powerful aspects is the, the naming uh, of those who died and naming them in chronological order, starting from the sort of the hinge, the middle of the V mm-hmm. of the memorial, mm-hmm. and and the powerful way in which that allows people to interact with the yeah. memorial, something that people never did before on mm-hmm. the Washington Mall. So people do rubbings of names, they touch them, and then they began to leave objects there. Yeah that um, at first the Park Service put in the lost and found, and then they thought, oh, people are doing this deliberately. There's a whole archive of them now. And so the sense that it sparked a conversation, which is more often than not a conversation with the dead, was Mm -hmm. very powerful and something that just had not happened in that national space uh, That is fascinating. I have not realized that before, Mm -hmm. but for the many times that I visited the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Mm -hmm. Memorial, especially Lincoln, because Mm -hmm. it was right a very short walk from the State Department Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. I was uh, working for a while and I could walk Mm -hmm. there almost every lunch hour when the weather was decent. I just felt like it was a great way Mm -hmm. to walk and go up and see them all from the the, the point of view. And Lincoln's words are there. Lincoln's Mm -hmm. words are around him inside. And yet I never found myself talking (laughs) <laughs> to Abraham Lincoln. I never found myself feeling the need to crawl up and try to make an etching of those carved letters. And to the best of my knowledge, I mean, there may have been people muttering to themselves uh, in and around that monument, uh, mem- uh, memorial, <laughs> but not many of them were trying to connect with Abraham Lincoln through that that tactile, uh, the, that experience. Um, Vietnam, at least at the p- p- time it went up, does seem to be unique in that way, doesn't it? Yes. And I think you have to think too there about how how the design uh, really shapes the kinds of activities that are encouraged there. So mm-hmm. the, the, the Lincoln Memorial is very moving in part because of the words on the walls, but it's yeah. also very monumental, right? You are really not supposed to have a tactile experience there. Mm-hmm. And it is the intimacy and the size of the Vietnam Memorial yeah. and the encouragement to, to touch that uh, shapes of, and the fact that you sort of walk down into it. I mean, mm-hmm. Maya Lin talks about sort of cutting into the earth. Yeah. So in many ways, it is very anti-monumental uh, in its design. Right. right. And that, that does intend, and I think succeeds, in creating a contemplative, space. Right? Yeah. I would just say one other thing. So, of course, part of the debate about it was that it's a modernist abstract design. And mm-hmm. I think the many veterans were opposed to it in part because they had only this sketch of what it would look like that really makes it look yeah. just like a big modernist slab. You don't have a sense right. of the names from mm-hmm. the sketch. Mm-hmm. But what part when when they had to make a compromise in order to open it and they hired um, a sculptor to to make a figurative sculpture of the three soldiers, um, then other people felt left out, right? The names are inclusive, but yes. once you have, and I think when you're talking about this moment in history, it's also a moment in history where the idea that you can have just like one figure represent everybody has kind of been questioned so much. So 
when the soldiers were put up, there was a big debate about, you know, well, one is clearly African American. Mm-hmm. Is the other guy Jewish? Is he Hispanic? Who's included there? Right. <laughs> and then, and then the women felt left out and they said, well, you know, we were fine when it was just the names, but now you've put those right. guys up there. We need a women's statue, which of course they were given. It's not a particularly good one, but so, uh, you know, I think that we are also at a moment uh, and we really see this in a lot of the memorials that were produced afterwards, this kind mm-hmm. of struggle between representation yep. and figuration and abstract modernist design. And it's extended. It's funny. It's extended beyond that, not just do, are we accurately and adequately representing the people involved in what we're memorializing, mm-hmm. but even when you have a, an FDR memorial mm-hmm. or a Martin Luther King memorial, are we representing the stages of that person's life. Mm-hmm. And we can't just put up one figure. You know, right. That would be wrong. You know, we, we, we need to show mm-hmm. different ones. And that led to a lot of controversy over the Eisenhower mm-hmm. uh, memorial. How, mm-hmm. how are we going to represent him as a, mm-hmm. as a small boy in Kansas looking out? <laughs> um, but wait, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. he wasn't, we were not memorializing the fact that he was once a young boy. We're, mm-hmm. you know, we're trying to remember right. the fact that he was a a military leader in a time of great conflict against great evil. And he was a, a president who did. So these issues of representation don't mm-hmm. stop just with the right. the war memorials. Right, right. And I you point, I mean, both of those are very interesting for the question of s- the struggle over mm-hmm. how to represent the aesthetics of it, right? So FDR's memorial is really one of the few memorials that actually represents citizens, right? It has citizens right. standing in a bread line. Right. right. And the MLK memorial is so massive, it's almost like Soviet socialist realist art. And I understand the motive behind mm-hmm. that to sort of insert him in the mall and say he belongs here and he's right. a towering figure. But I find it aesthetically actually quite problematic. Well, from a distance, when, when you don't, when you're not up close seeing his features, but when you're just uh-huh. seeing the way it's carved, uh, it is reminiscent of a North Korean leader, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. It's like a, a statue of Kim somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of the the stage we have for, and and there are others I'm sure we'll bounce back to as points of comparison here, but. You've taken a, a really good look at the various ways of memorializing 9-11 uh, in New York, at the Pentagon, in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, but also in thousands of locations around the country that most people don't know about unless it happens to be in their hometown and there happens to be some kind of a small memorial. But there are many, many memorials around the country related to 9-11 in a way that makes it I, I want to say unique. I, I know there are many World War I, World War II, Civil War memorials, um, but in terms of the entire breadth of the United States and the apparent lack of direct connection to 9-11, <laughs> where many of these are. So I want to break that down a, a bit with you by by starting about those Let's let's do those objects first, and then then we'll move to New York and the Pentagon and Shanksville. Okay. So, mm-hmm. let's talk about those thousands of objects that are mm-hmm. are spread around. Mm-hmm. Um, when you really dug into this and and found out just how many there were, <laughs> and why different communities were getting them, um, what struck you about that and stood out to you as different from the other memorializations that you've studied? Yeah, I. It certainly is an excess of memory. And when we see that, we have to ask, what is it about besides memorialization, right? What is motivating uh, this? And I, I think it's important for us to remember that people were calling for memorials really by September 12th, right? I mean, so we were already in this context in which memorialization had been thought about a lot and a lot had been produced around it. And it was even before the numbers of dead were known, there was, we have to have a memorial, right? And that that is unusual, right? That's not a normal activity because often these these conflicts that are memorialized, Mm -hmm. like World War II and Mm -hmm. Korea, right? um, they they will have an end point at which maybe people start talking about memorialization, but it's not all happening in one day 
right. leading people to immediately react. Yeah, and I, I, I think that initial response was also a desire to see the event, which was certainly not understood what it was at that point, right? the definition of the event to under, to feel that it was over, right. It was just one day. And, and, uh, you know, I feel very strongly that the desire to focus 9-11 on that one day, which is really evident in, in the museum uh, is, is really problematic for understanding what it means as an event and what it means in, in U S history. So I think some of that, we must memorialize this now is uh, comes out of a fear and a, and chaos and and just a sense that we can contain it in a certain right. way. Right. Um, and in that sense, do you think there's a almost a collective psychology? I don't want to say a benefit to it, but the idea of having some sense of closure. Mm-hmm. This obviously, if people are talking about it on September twelfth, mm-hmm. that's premature closure. For- <laughs> yeah. For an event that had dramatic implications mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. national security, mm-hmm. foreign policy, um, even Americans' internal policing uh, mm-hmm. for, for decades, right. obviously that's premature closure. Mm-hmm. But the sense psychologically of we don't want to be living in fear. We don't want mm-hmm. to be looking up at the sky and constantly be mm-hmm. worrying about planes mm-hmm. hitting can we put some kind of a bow on this, even if it's relatively mm-hmm. quickly to make ourselves feel better? Is that is there an mm-hmm. element there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure any of that would have been necessarily thought through. I mean, I do think it was about the shock. It was about this terrible, terrible sense of loss, which, which I think shaped all of the decisions about memorialization in the years to come and was particularly raw uh, in the beginning. Um, I, I think in in those moments we we grapple uh, with uh, uh, collective activities that will help uh, will reassure us and, and comfort us. I mean, it's very interesting to make a comparison to the pandemic, right? When Biden and Vice President Harris uh, did this memorial the night before the inauguration, it really was one of the first times that we'd had this kind of national. I mean, they just, it was so simple. It was very beautiful in its simplicity with the lights along right. the reflecting pool, the Lincoln Memorial, of course, right? Um, and the sense that we have no idea how to memorialize this pandemic right. in which hundreds of thousands of Americans have died, right? Yeah. And in general, actually, pandemics are, are not memorialized. No, the, the, way the, that the, wars the 1917 are. or 1918 right. flu yeah. pandemic. I, I can't think of any memorial to that. I think there's than... one small one somewhere, that, right? Yeah. And, but that was museum. actually the radical intervention of the AIDS quilt because it was mm. not only a memorial and a memorial that wanted to speak to the nation, especially when it came to Washington, but also it was an activist memorial precisely because epidemics don't get memorialized, right? So I, I, I've... I, I understand that immediate urge to memorialize uh, 9-11. And certainly in New York, especially around lower Manhattan, there were lots of vernacular memorials and small things that happened in the, in the early years. Um, and, and I think that the desire of, and if all around New York Harbor, for instance, in New Jersey and, uh, Staten Island and Jersey City and, uh, you know, there's all of these memorials that are kind of facing toward uh, ground right. zero, right? Let's, so regionally, there's a lot and they make sense. It makes sense. People died, talk, who lived there died. Yeah. Let's, let's mm-hmm. talk about one of those in particular, because I think it <laughs> contrasts dramatically with another one that I'll bring up across mm-hmm. the, the country. But one that, that some people are familiar with is in mm-hmm. Jersey City. Mm-hmm. And they may not know the name. Um, Empty Sky, I believe, mm-hmm. is is the name mm-hmm. that was put on it yeah. by its designers. But it sits uh, right by the water there in Liberty State Park, pointing directly at the site of the former mm-hmm. Twin Towers and now, you know, right. Freedom Tower. Um, describe that. Describe Empty Sky a bit for mm-hmm. to kind of uh, in words make us visualize it mm-hmm. and and how you think it works as a memorial for people 
many of whom lived in Jersey City who did die uh, mm -hmm. in those attacks. Yeah, I think this is one of the more successful uh, memorials. Uh, it was designed by Frederick Schwartz. Uh, and he, this one he worked with uh, Jessica Jamras. He also designed another one in um, Westchester. And uh, and the title refers to the Bruce Springsteen song, uh, Empty mm -hmm. Sky. Mm -hmm. um, so its site specificity gives it very, very powerful meaning, right? Um, and initially, obviously, it was sort of when you stood at the end of these two long uh, stone walls where names are inscribed, you were looking at the empty sky. And that, that sense of absence of the buildings was so powerful for people who lived in, in the area. You had always used the Twin Towers to sort of locate where you were. And, and, and I, you know, on one hand, I'm a little suspicious of the way in which that constant talk about absence was often about mourning the buildings rather than those who died. But on the other hand, I, mm. I understand how mm. people were trying so hard to make sense of that, right? So there's a kind of simplicity to this memorial that I think is very powerful. And also it, it's, uh, it does, it is a tribute to those who died in New Jersey. There were several hundred people who died in New Jersey and, and, mm -hmm. and this sort of sense also of, of the, the whole region and how the region sort of functions together mm -hmm. around the river and the Harbor. So it's site specificity is actually quite, powerful. And I find that the empty sky moniker is is fascinating now because as you point <laughs> out it was it was designed to show the empty mm -hmm. space that was mm -hmm. once filled by these mm -hmm. um controversial at the time of construction buildings mm -hmm. of the World Trade Center. Uh, and that and that is the context for it. And yet now <laughs> with One World Trade Center there it is no longer technically empty sky in the sense that it was meant but at a deeper level, it actually does work because it makes you realize, no, the the sky is still empty for for the victims. Mm -hmm. um, the sky is still empty of maybe coming to grips with the legacy of nine eleven. Mm -hmm. So if one if one reflects on it, empty sky may may not be an outdated name for mm -hmm. it simply because of that construction. I, I would agree, though. I think also. One of the effects of it now is that you look out on One World Trade Center and you think, really? That's what we got? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yep. So, uh, oh, you know. You're not, you're so not alone it, in thinking that. Right, I know. of course, I know I'm not right. But so, you know, it, in fact, actually, I think both meanings kind of coexist. You know, yeah. And, and then, of course, for people in Jersey City or even people mm -hmm. in New York who, for some reason, would go there to see the memorial and look backward, which is a, a very small minority, there is meaning because of the place. Um, yes. it, is, it is a visceral feeling there mm -hmm. as you stand there and you realize, okay, um, mm -hmm. I could be in my memory watching the planes hit the towers from this vantage point. Right. It's, it's very tangible. Mm -hmm. Let's contrast that with one of the, uh, one of the memorials that you highlight, which which I found amazing in, I think it's Rosemead, California, called Reflect, mm -hmm. which is a sculpture that's composed of two very large hands, which are each in turn composed of bird shapes made from stainless steel, I believe. Yes. Um, and they do add up, that is the, the birds that make up the hands do add up to the number of people killed on 9-11 mm -hmm. and they're holding up a piece of steel. So mm -hmm. for listeners, just imagine, and, and in the show mm -hmm. notes, we'll link to a picture of this, mm -hmm. but imagine two uh, almost translucent hands because of the nature of the bird sculptures holding up a massive steel girder. So Marita, talk us through this. What was the, what was the design uh, element here? Um, and and why Rosemead, California, with with a steel girder from from the World Trade Center? Yeah. So one of the reasons why there are over twelve hundred memorials around the country and even a few uh, around the world to nine eleven 
has a lot to do with the fact that the Port Authority created a program to hand out steel. I mean, we just that it just would not have happened in the same way. And that program really started in 2010, so almost 10 years uh, after 9/11. Was there a real demand for it? Were communities around the country writing to the Port Authority <laughs> saying, "We want your steel"? <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that question. I, I the the Port Authority had a hangar full of steel, and yeah. uh, the supply uh, and, was there. And you know, some of the steel from so a lot of this raises a lot of questions about how objects that came out of the massive, massive destruction uh, in Lower Manhattan acquired a kind of sacred status. Right now, some of the steel was just recycled right some of it was recycled into navy ships as mm -hmm. i mentioned but mm -hmm. others was just you know recycled the way steel gets recycled it was refuse category of refuse right but a lot of it had been tagged by a team at ground zero when it was being cleared and they had a lot of it and so some of that went to the museum some of it went to the new york state museum in albany uh, and i think they 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 saw that there was a potential demand and uh, and they created this program in very earnest terms i have to say uh and uh and and they talked a lot about how the steel symbolizes resilience and strength and you know we can think of all the ways in which steel has had a lot of national meaning because of its role a very dominant role in 20th 20, 20, right. 20th century industrial uh, right. capitalism now mourned right but so all these these towns asked for some steel and then they were required to do something with it once they did that so so the steel really did promote this now Heath Sato is kind of interesting because he really worked with the community mm -hmm. uh, he had them vote on a couple of different designs right uh, I was interested in his because it, it really take it takes this very large piece of steel, yeah. right, and turns it into a handheld object. So right. the scale of it functions yeah. in a kind of interesting way, right? But all these towns, Palm Beach, Laguna Beach, you know, why are they building 9-11 memorials is the question that we want to ask, right? And, and I think increasingly as memorials were built they had very little to do with anyone from the region mm -hmm. who um, had a connection to that day mm -hmm. i think it really was making an affirmative statement about national unity and as we get further and further i mean this program ends in 2016 it's not that long ago as we get further and further away from September 11th, that national unity or that illusion of national unity <laughs> gets weaker and weaker, right? So, so I, I, I do think that it's uh, this proliferation of memorials is much more than just memorializing. And I do say that the only other event in U.S. history that received this level of memorialization is the Civil War. And, and mm. you're right that that was actually a, a bit more regional. There's not a lot of Civil War memorials in California, for instance. But, and in a very different way, uh, regionally. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and but we it's important for us to remember that many of those Civil War memorials were built uh, many, many decades after the Civil War uh, as a response to moments of uh, protests around racial yep. injustice, et cetera. Right. So, so they were never about the, they were not really about the civil war either. Right. right. So, yeah. Well, let's, um, let's move away from, from New York, uh, but mm -hmm. we'll come back to it for the, mm -hmm. the, the, the Memorial Museum, mm -hmm. uh, gift shop and everything else there, <laughs> um, which I, I like many have strong feelings about, mm -hmm. but let, let's hit the other, what I'll call the big ones first. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's come. Let's come to Washington uh, area. Let's talk about the National 9/11 mm -hmm. Pentagon Memorial. Uh, can you describe its use of of benches and the creative way, uh, frankly, that the the designers chose to array those benches in a way to impart meaning to to the very structure of the memorial itself? Mm -hmm. 
so this uh, memorial, which is designed by Keith Caseman and Julie Beckman, it was the first memorial that uh, opened. And um, the process moved a bit quicker there than in other contexts, in part because it's the Pentagon, they were organized, uh, nobody had to fight over ownership of the space. It does make um, some things easier. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I have questions about whether or not it makes sense for the memorial to be where it is at the Pentagon, but the demand that the, the sort of sense that it needed to be site specific was quite powerful. I mean, it's kind of wedged in between the Pentagon and this road and a parking right. lot. Um, it's yeah. not a very, as many people have remarked, it's not a very contemplative uh, space. No, far, and, far from it. The highway yeah. noise is inescapable when you're there. And it's important for the site because it literally mm -hmm. is where the plane right. came down over that road, mm -hmm. uh, approached the ground and, and hit that wall of the Pentagon. So the memorial is literally where the remains were and, and where, right. where the plane entered the building. So I understand the site mm -hmm. choice. Um, you can't get away from that. You can't pretend mm -hmm. it happened somewhere right. else, but it's very hard to accomplish both purposes of being mm -hmm. connected physically to that mm -hmm. uh, hallowed ground and right. also be a place where people can truly reflect without mm -hmm. having the noises of life all right. around them. And airplanes going overhead. To, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, the memorial has these elements that are in, that intend to create contemplative spaces. So there is a bench with water underneath for each person who was killed. Uh, it also has, I, I think looking at it shows us sort of the complex decision-making that go into how one arranges things in a memorial, right? So they've chosen to have a couple elements here that are almost forms of reenactment, right? Mm -hmm. The benches that are for those who died in the building mm -hmm. are placed so that you see the building when you're reading their names. Right. The benches for those who were on the plane are in the opposite direction. So Which you an, are... An amazing... And I would not have thought of this. This is probably why I'm not involved in architecture and design <laughs> and memorialization. But what a brilliant, along with the other elements you're about to mention, what, what a brilliant way of um, data visualization is what people would say if it were online. Right. But it's, it's an important way because otherwise, you know, an alphabetical list of names mm -hmm. Has no meaning other than the name. The, has no meaning right. other than the length of the list itself, and perhaps right. the demographics of the names in some sense. But mm -hmm. an alphabetical list doesn't convey meaning by its very arrangement in the way that uh, the mm -hmm. Pentagon Memorial does. Right, and how to arrange names is just a huge dilemma for memorial designers. That's part of why the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is chronological uh, from when people died, because a uh, an alphabetical list turned them into to turn those who died into statistics a lot of people had similar names right so so they they had this question here about how to arrange them and they actually chose to use age as a primary way of arranging the benches right which does mean that the memorial pays particular attention to the young children who were killed there were five yeah. of them i think uh, and then there's a kind of gap and then other people. I, I'm not sure how meaningful that is, but I think the designers hoped that that would help us to see people as individuals, uh, which is a, a, a real key aim of memorials mm -hmm. of collective death, right? How do we, naming, it does a, a big part of that work to individualize people out of this kind of mass, right? But um, here, I think because they couldn't, some memorials use where people died, like the Oklahoma City Memorial, mm -hmm. the benches are arranged to approximately where people were when they were killed. Mm -hmm. That would never have worked here, obviously. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think they, they, they hoped that that kind of arrangement would allow visitors to reflect upon these people who, as individuals who were arbitrarily caught up in this historic, violent moment. Do you think that age-based presentation 
um, if not unique in memorialization, uh, is rare. Yeah, I would say because I can't, rare. I can't think of another one. Um, I can't say that I've gone to mm -hmm. other war memorials mm -hmm. and and gotten any sense of the children who who mm -hmm. are honored there. Mm -hmm. But this one, you can't avoid it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but it raises an issue uh, anytime. Anytime you um, organize something mm -hmm. and you make a choice how to organize it, you are excluding other possibilities or you have to find a workaround, which can often be awkward. So in right. this case, you have a, a young child. What's the youngest was five or three. Uh, I can't remember. Yes. But you have yeah. them on the, the outlier on the memorial. But they, the child was traveling with family. So right. in this memorial, how is it that they get around that? Because you can't put the families together if you're organizing by age, but how can you still convey that there was a family unit? Right. So that was three-year-old Dana Falkenberg, who with yes. her eight-year-old yeah. sister Zoe and her parents were killed. So they, it does raise a dilemma, right? She's, her bench is not near their benches, right? And so they chose to put the family members' names um, on uh, the benches of other family members. Right? Okay. Um, okay. And I, hmm. so, and there weren't that many families on the flight, so it may be right. that that aided them in that mm -hmm. decision. But you can see the dilemma there. Of yeah. course, when you think about this family, it's just incredibly horrible to think about this family right. who are just gone, right, all together, right? Yeah. And so um, uh, mm. I, I would say, I, I'm not sure the memorial resolves these issues. I think it actually shows us how complicated they are, right. how hard it is to memorialize a group uh, that are arbitrarily thrown together in death. But that does raise a bigger question, uh, Marita, which is, can a memorial resolve mm -hmm. these issues? Because... There are choices in architecture and design and format and narrative around it. You Can you actually resolve everything around something that you want to memorialize, or is that a fool's errand? Well, I, I think that we often ask memorials to do more than they possibly can do, right? We invest a huge amount in them. We want them to resolve much bigger issues uh, about our culture and our nation than they possibly can. Right? So there will always be ways in which uh, they fall short of those kinds of social demands. I would think they almost have to. And we'll get back to this as we... <laughs> As we close and I ask you about mm. your, your opinion of 9-11 memorials in general, but it, it almost sets up, a, I almost want to say, a false target that somehow we mm. can have closure or resolution of major issues. Well, if you're also addressing the causes of the conflict of whatever you're memorializing and also the implications and the tragedy caused by overreaction, perhaps, to an event, mm. If you can't resolve the day itself in terms of right. putting families together, um, it's a really high bar for a designer to clear to also be able to resolve mm -hmm. societal issues, military issues, technology, security, uh, mm -hmm. all of these things. Um, probably that's that's why it takes a lot of courage mm -hmm. to actually step up and try to design one right. of these memorials. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, I think one of the more challenging ones in that respect mm -hmm. was the Flight 93 Memorial mm -hmm. in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, um, often, you know, linked to Shanksville, the, the closest municipality, I believe, to it. But in there in Somerset County, it's interesting that unlike the Pentagon, and, and especially unlike uh, the World Trade Center, the events of that day, there, there's no image of the flight or the crash, save one, which was one photograph, which was merely a plume of smoke in the distance taken by someone nearby. So the the ability of Flight 93 to embed itself uh, in, our, in, in our cultural memory is lower on the visual scale, but in many ways it's higher 
because of the recordings from Flight 93 mm-hmm. and you know the the passengers and and what they did, which adds a different element to the desire to memorialize what happened mm-hmm. in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. So talk through that memorial a bit and how its presentation is obviously quite different than the Pentagon's mm-hmm. presentation. How did they choose to memorialize the the, the crash of Flight 93 uh, in that physical space that they had? Uh, I think that the Flight 93 memorial, uh, w- one of the things that's most important to say about it is that it's run by the National Park Service. And uh, I think that... And the others are, n- are not. They are not. The, right. Both of them are run by private foundations. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. it's a little bit more complicated in relationship to the... Uh, to the, the role of the Pentagon uh, in, in Virginia. But um, in New York, we have um, a purely separate enterprise, right? And I, I, I think when I went to Pennsylvania, I, I felt that I felt this just enormous appreciation for the, the role of the National Park Service as a, a, as a what do you mean? What did they do? Um... Well, I, I, they, they are experts in this, right? They are our national experts in this, and and in the creation of meaningful sites, whether they're about memory or something else. There's a kind of carefulness to how they approach things. Um, they they have a gift shop in their interpretive center, but let's just say the whole context is so much more understated than what you see in in New York. I feel like their their role, also there was a big negotiation that took place there about the land, which was owned by a couple mining companies, one of whom wanted to really profit off of the tragedy. Um, The role of the, the, the Park Service was very important in keeping a lot of things in check uh, there. And so, um, the, the memorial itself is actually quite rural. A huge amount of it is this kind of big landscape park space that was a former mine site. And um, the interpretive center is up on a hill. And then you walk down to the, the memorial that has various walkways. And, you know, it's the memorial itself doesn't really stand out that much. It's also kind of understated. But I, in a certain sense, that's kind of a relief given uh, the excessive memorialization context that we're talking about. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the story of Flight 93 p- produced so many very, very powerful imaginaries, right, that uh, what... Um, Many people remark upon the kind of understated nature of the memorial, and I think that's quite a- appropriate uh, to that uh, context. There's now, also a lot a of, lo- of na- it does have a wall of names, correct? Yes, it does. A, a wall yeah. of, where each name is on its own sort of panel. It's, it's very simple. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and then this kind of long walkway, and they also separate out. Uh, the area of impact. No one is allowed to go there unless they're a family member. They have some remains there that are also separated out. There's a kind of carefulness. Also, there are a lot of locals involved in it. There's a lot of local volunteers. There's, you have a sort of sense of the local community being invested in the memorial uh, as a project, though no one locally uh, was killed. And as I say in, in my description of it, this is very. This is rural, rural America, mining country, uh, but it's only eighteen minutes flying time from uh, from Washington D.C. And so it's kind of a reminder of how <laughs> airplane travel really re restructures landscapes uh, and connects them. Uh, Absolutely, it uh, brought to mind then, and is is hitting me again now that there was a, a plane crash a couple of decades ago. Mm-hmm. It was on approach to Dulles Airport, which mm-hmm. is in right around the boundary between Fairfax County and Loudoun County, Virginia, um, but a DC metropolitan area airport. And this air cr- crash was into what people on the East Coast might call a mountain, but people in the Rockies would laugh and say they're glorified hills. 
mm-hmm. in the Appalachians. Um, but a flight was coming in on approach and actually crashed into uh, one of the mountains there. Mm-hmm. And it was not that close to Dulles. It, mm-hmm. it was in far western, uh, northern Virginia, but far western mm-hmm. areas of it, which just shows that the the landing paths for these planes coming into these major airports mm-hmm. do start many, right. many miles away. Yeah. And you forget just how close southern Pennsylvania is mm-hmm. um, to the flight path, uh, primarily for Dulles, but then also coming into Reagan National uh, right. as well. Right. Um, let's contrast the Flight 93 Memorial then um, with with the big ones, the, mm-hmm. the 9-11 Museum in New York, and of course, the, the other things around it, ranging from the Oculus to the gift shop to the architecture that has been built mm-hmm. around the new One World Trade Center. But let's start with, with the museum. Um, mm-hmm. You draw, and, and many people have been to the museum, so this will be familiar to, to quite a few people, but you draw a real contrast in the museum between what's called the last column, that huge steel column upon entering, and the relatively odd display nearby of the brick from the Abbottabad compound, the Navy SEAL jacket, and the CIA challenge coin. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about that that contrast and perhaps that clash between the um, between those objects and the near fetishization of some of those things. The the museum is a very complicated and conflicted institution, right? It has many goals. Some of those goals are in conflict uh, with each other, right? It, it's a memorial museum, which means it's about memorializing those who died, not just in New York, but um, uh, throughout the whole event of 9-11. Uh, but it also tries to be a history museum and to tell the least, most, uh, particularly the story of that day. And, and so we see, in a certain sense, that embodied in those two objects that I, I start my discussion with. The last column was the last piece of steel taken out of Grand Zero in, I think it was May 2002, uh, after the site had been heroically cleared uh, of debris. It had a lot of um, I guess you would call it graffiti on it, but uh, in the sense that uh, yeah. a lot of the Almost recovery instant workers, memorializations, and, <laughs> right? yeah. the, the FDNY and the NYPD and uh, the Port Authority police had, had written inscriptions on it and, and taped things on it and used it as a kind of in immediate uh, memorial. And, you know, it was treated like a sacred object. It was brought out of Grand Zero uh, with a, uh, an honor guard. Uh, and there was no doubt from the beginning that if there were a museum, and I just want to say the museum project really did not come into being until conceptually until about 2004, 2005, right? There were many other things proposed uh, for right. the site. So so it is a very meaningful object. And um, on display there, there's also um, Jake Barton and the local projects uh, team had done a whole set of digital displays that explain many of the inscriptions uh, on it. Right? And the, the objects in the museum are very, very powerful um, on display. A lot of them are the, you know, bashed up fire engines. A lot of them are very big, right? They, they're impressive in their scale. They, they are definitely a way in which museum visitors come to feel a sense of the massiveness of the event, the scale of the and, destruction. And that is one of the, the features that, I mean, the design mm-hmm. of that, of that space is to make use of that space yes. with the, the yes. slurry wall that held back yeah. the, the Hudson right. river, um, allowing you mm-hmm. to have a relatively large space underground mm-hmm. so that these truly massive objects mm-hmm can be part of the, the visitor right. experience. Yes, and, and uh, it, the, the last column is in the foundation hall, which is the largest space of the museum. And we're, you're seven stories underground there. Uh, it's a reminder, especially for 
those of us who used to go through the uh, the shopping mall and the transportation hub underneath the original World Trade Center, that it was a massive space underground. And the the actual space of the museum is quite oddly shaped, in part because the two footprints from the memorial pools come down into it, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. because it's, it's, it's restricted to a certain amount by the subways and the path trains, and, and, and it was just this big um, shopping space. So certainly when you're down there, the space itself is quite awe-inspiring and, and, right. and impressive, right? Now, the, the Osama bin Laden brick is such an odd object. And um, I know it was added to the museum collection after the museum had opened. It was donated by Dom- Dominique Di Natale, who was a reporter mm-hmm. um, who had chiseled it out from the compound before the compound was torn down. Right. And the compound prevent- was torn down, quite honestly, to... Pre- to- to prevent, prevent memorialization. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to there's prevent an irony here. precisely that kind of trophy hunting. But yeah. um, I, one of the things that I was very struck by with it is, is that um, uh, it, the museum itself mm-hmm. uh, does a, really a very poor job of talking about the aftermath of uh, 9-11, the wars, uh, everything that the United States pursued in that aftermath and, and all of the outcomes in the wake uh, of 9-11. They try to do it, but it's very hurried. It's very cursory. And so their focus really is on that day. And, and there's almost nothing in the museum that talks about um, uh, Osama bin Laden after 9-11, right? So so it, it's really a lost opportunity for the museum to make sense of things. Right? And part of my critique of the museum, because I think there are many things that the museum does well, including telling us the impossibly dramatic and very moving and horrific story of the day of 9-11 in New York City. Right. Uh, but yeah. it, it, because it, wants to define the event in such a contained way, uh, it, it is really unable to be a pedagogical historical museum in a way that, that one needs it to, to be. Hmm. Do you contrast it in that way with the Holocaust Museum, perhaps? Or some? are there other museums? Let me Let me try to phrase this in a way that that gets to a deeper meaning for something which had that much magnitude for so many people, um, Mm -hmm. you know, one day literally out of the sky, um, people watching it on television, feeling it emotionally, even if they had no connection to New York directly. Um, There have been other events in history that had dramatic effects too. Do the museums centered around each of those provide a role model when you're saying that the 9-11 museum could have done better in that regard? Is it because you have proof of concept elsewhere to say, but look, it was done here to relatively good effect. So why did they miss the opportunity? Quite a few people have made the comparison to the Holocaust Museum. And, and that is in part because the Holocaust Museum, in its very careful design and narrative sets out to to teach us um, lessons to be learned from this event. That message is a lot less clear uh, at the 9-11 Museum. We're invited to mourn. We are invited to, um, to be sort of awe-inspired by the destruction, by the spectacle of the event itself. We're invited to feel the humanity of those who died, to to be caught up in the drama of the day. Uh, But we're offered very little to help us make sense of why it happened. Very little, right? And also uh, what what happened in its wake. And so, and then we exit to the gift shop. So 
so in a certain sense the yeah. the yeah. the museum is caught up in uh, a set of competing kinds of goals uh, in which the idea of contextualizing 9-11 as an event in the context of global politics is not really one. And I, I would say that I use the term 9-11 exceptionalism in, in the book to talk about how this event is mythologized mm-hmm. as unparalleled in history. Now, we all know, right, <laughs> right. I yeah. hate to say it, there's a lot of other really horrific events. but mm-hmm. um, uh, And there are all sorts of reasons why that narrative needs to be questioned, but also is so powerful, mm-hmm. right? Because if 9-11 is the exception, then we can... We can change the laws. We can change the moral discourse that governs our nation. Right. And also the museum, after many debates about the kind of institution that should be built, including a desire to build something called the International Freedom Center there, mm-hmm. the museum's mission, as defined especially by its staff, was this is going to be only about 9-11. Yeah. Right? We are not going to contextualize it. Right? right. Not too far. Right. And so... And was the yeah, idea there really, that was the idea there that it would, in a sense, uh, cheapen the analysis and, and loosen the focus on the loss of life on that day? Yeah, it's yeah. because it's really a memorial museum. Yeah. So this sort of sense that any any reflection, any reflection, perhaps on the fact that that you know this attack might have been a response to U.S. foreign policy, they anything didn't... beyond that that might sort of Right. spread the blame a little they didn't want to would, get there would yeah. well it that it would be somehow a way that dishonored those who died that day right well and and i think here and a devil's advocate to to your argument that that should be included uh might be you know look at the memorial in hawaii for the attack on pearl harbor and mm-hmm. you know do, does it do we need a museum at Pearl Harbor that goes into the root causes of Japanese imperialism and Japanese mm-hmm. culture and the desire for raw resources and the United mm-hmm. States having a large enough Navy that Japan knew that it couldn't mm-hmm. do that? And then also examine World War II and the, you know, the fire bombings in, right. in Japan and the nuclear weapons mm-hmm. and then the Cold War. <laughs> and then at a certain point, right. And and I'm not sure there's an answer for mm. what where is the right place to bound any particular museum because mm. a museum of Pearl Harbor that's tr- seeking to talk about the thousands of lives mm. that day and the actual mm. event can't cover everything from ancient Japanese history mm-hmm. to Cold War politics. Right. Um, and I'm and I would say some people would argue the 9/11 museum mm. would have a really hard time bounding it if they did go into causes and effects Mm -hmm. because it's a really slippery slope on both ends. Yeah. I realize it's a high bar and also a very, very difficult task, but they do make small attempts to that, which fail. Right. So, so the question is, should they just have avoided that altogether? You know, um, in a certain sense, they can't not talk about what happened after. I mean, there's a whole display about, the recovery effort in New York City and things like that. So I I understand the dilemma to them. And I know they struggled a lot with these kinds of things. I'm not unsympathetic uh, mm-hmm. to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's another dilemma that they faced and, and still has people uh, very energized over and <laughs> they probably will be forever. Um one of them is the controversy over remains or potential remains. The fact that some unidentified remains are, are behind a wall in the museum, even though they are not formally on display, is one aspect of this. Another aspect of this is what has come to be known as the composite, the pancaked, compressed floors that were, were down to several feet because of the intense uh, gravitational and um, temperature pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, talk through that controversy just a little bit in terms of, especially the family members who feel that mm-hmm. that this is inappropriate mm-hmm. inside a, a public museum. The decision to house unidentified remains in a space within the museum, which 
probably most visitors don't know is there. There's a tiny little right. uh, sign. Um, it's almost impossible to figure out who really decided that the, the museum sort of disavows it. I don't think they're happy about it uh, being there. Uh, and it really um, has angered uh, many family members. I, I think it's important to situate that in this broader context of identification of remains, right? And our desire as a society to believe that we can identify remains even in the face of these this horrific yeah. modern violence. The CSI right? effect is is a problem for prosecutors who feel mm-hmm. like you know juries expect them to be able mm-hmm. to piece yes. together every forensic detail, but also mm-hmm. in a case like this where right. sorry, the science just doesn't yeah. allow it. Physics just doesn't right. allow it. Yeah, and you know, eighty million dollars uh, of federal money, you know, incredible efforts, uh, and you know, they were often identifying tiny little fragments. So if you really think it through, and, and Jay Aronson has a wonderful book uh, that talks about this in detail, um, it's a horrific experience of for for the families themselves, and actually many of them, the the medical examiner's office was quite sensitive and gave families the option of, of opting out after a while or even from the whole process, right? But I think it reveals something that we be, we believe so strongly in forensic science. I was going to say in science, but right now that's a little bit under question. So uh, in forensic science. That's, that's a it, wider conversation, <laughs> right? <laughs> for another podcast. So, so um, we believe that, that, we science should allow us to identify through through DNA, and that uh, that all remains are potentially identifiable, and and so that desire to to sort of factually establish certain things really flies in the face of the kind of massive destruction that took place that day and that takes place in many parts of the world all the time right um uh many cultures in the world have ways of mourning people who have not been identified mourning people whose remains have never been found it's been happening throughout the entirety of history right and so this is actually a, a little bit of an aberration uh, for that demand to be so powerful they should have put them somewhere else. They did that in Oklahoma City. They're not at the memorial. They're in another um, state building, and mm-hmm. and they they may eventually be moved. Uh, I, I don't know, but right. it certainly um, has angered uh, many people that they're there. Yeah. Uh, also, before we move on from the museum to uh, a couple of other elements mm-hmm. nearby, uh, there are numerous sites in the museum. Uh, unlike most other museums, where visitors can um, share their impressions and their stories. And this, I think, has become a more modern trend. I I don't think that's a tradition going back to much older museums, but in a lot of more recent museums, kind of that interactive experience, maybe born of social media, Mm -hmm. um, is the the need for people to connect with the material. but it, it's it's striking to me that this is a museum that charges what almost thirty dollars a head to get in twenty six yeah yeah it's a private museum um, you're you're getting a very biased view of <laughs> impressions and memories because you are not getting a lot of people just socioeconomically mm-hmm. you're not getting a lot of people uh, you know a family of five or six mm-hmm. who is of limited means is not going to be coming into this museum to witness it, much less to leave impressions and stories. Um, So to the extent that this is a sharing experience about the people of New York, it's a very uh, very limited slice of New Yorkers' experience. Uh, And tourists around the country coming here um, are certainly socioeconomically well off enough to do so. Mm -hmm. If... If nothing else, the pandemic has also shown the problem of the sort of what we would call the kind of business model uh, of of 
the museum uh, at Ground Zero, which is quite dependent to run the museum. It's incredibly expensive to run the museum uh, uh, on uh, global tourists, right? Who are, guess what? Not here now and haven't been here for two years. So, so um, the story of how we ended up here is long and complicated and involves a lot of New York and national politics and politicians and lots of different kinds of stakes, including stakes in the real estate value of that little 16 acres of lower Manhattan, right? Uh, and I, I should also note the, mus the memorial, because of some of its features, is also incredibly expensive uh, to run. Right. Um, it has uh, water that freezes in winter. There have to be temperature things on that. Mm -hmm. It has lights, right? It's not just a memorial that goes up like yep. the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and it's just there, yeah. right? Yeah. There's incredible security costs there, excessive security at the site. Uh, yeah. And so I think that um, that the sort of commercial enterprise uh, of the museum mm -hmm. and the memorial has, has, has been the subject of a, of a significant amount of critique. It is run by a private foundation that, yeah. that former Mayor Bloomberg runs, right? But but the bottom line is that it was designed to uh, to generate income uh, for yeah. itself. Right? Right. Now, I just want to say, so the digital stuff, I think, which was also designed by Jake Barton and local projects, um, that it, I, I think it's it, it has a very interesting goal to create a kind of collective memory of 9-11, to mm. gather lots of testimonies, to give people the chance. Uh, he was involved with StoryCorps on NPR, the sort of the idea that we have a kind of collective storytelling here that can give us a broader sense of the meaning of this event. Mm -hmm. You're right that what they're going to gather at the museum will be a very particular demographic, mm -hmm. right? But I like their idea yeah. that we could push back on this singular narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the memorial at Ground Zero. And I, I, I want to uh, talk just very briefly about that before we return underground mm -hmm. to other aspects of, mm -hmm. of the site. The, this is perhaps the, the image that even people who have not gone back to the site are most familiar with because of the... Um, more rampant media coverage of it. But the memorial at Ground Zero is is all about the void. It really celebrates <laughs> the footprints of the two towers, um, which as you note, having looked at a lot of modern architecture and design around this, um, does tend to talk more about voids than, than creating objects. Um, but the pools actually create an interesting effect because you, you have the, the water falling into the, the void, and it, it makes noise. And it, it reminds me of what we talked about with the Pentagon site, mm -hmm. that it's loud enough that I guess that's a good thing that visitors aren't <laughs> interrupted by mm -hmm. babble and laughter of nearby people because you generally can't hear people that aren't mm -hmm. right next to you. Mm -hmm. But it's also not conducive to quiet reflection. Mm -hmm. I, I think we see at the in the memorial design, and in a certain sense, this was inevitable because the design contest happened very quickly and there were certain constraints on what designs could do from the very beginning, right? Because the footprints had been declared sacred by Governor Pataki, right? And once that happened, the space itself uh, became much more uh, limited in what could be done there. Um, uh, so the fact that the footprints got turned into sacred space uh, and the design by Michael Arad basically takes the footprints out of the plaza, right? You can only look into them. You can't really interact with them in any other way. Um, I, I think it's all about scale and this idea that this Again, it's 9-11 exceptionalism, that the scale of the event was so big that we had to have a huge memorial, right? Uh, and I actually think it's tragic that uh, we don't have 
a space there that's more of a public space with a small, intimate, potentially right. more moving memorial. Right, because right. it's it's not an area that has, you know, New Yorker pedestrian traffic moving through through regular thoroughfares. It it really has has become a tourist site primarily. Right. And that it is demarcated on all sides by security, security. architecture, yeah. by yeah. security bollards, by you know, police cars are always sitting there on what was Greenwich Street. Um, yeah. And the, I've taken groups of uh, foreigners there who say, oh, my God, there's so many security cameras here. You guys don't even see them. You know, uh, and, and across the street from One World Trade Center, which is basically a fortress, right? So, so yeah, it's not a public space. It's not a space conducive to hanging out and eating your lunch. There's very few places to sit, right? So so really the plaza is a space that where you look into the pools almost like a vista. Uh, and and you know, I think the water has a particular effect. You could say that it helps create more intimate kinds of groupings around the memorial. But it's so massive and overpowering that I think it really dwarfs the names, which are the most important feature uh, at the memorial. Right. The names and, The names are on the, 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 the footprints of the buildings around these pools, around the, the void. Right. They're um, on the periphery yeah. of the pools. In the initial design, he really wanted people to go to underground chambers and to have a much more intimate experience of the names. But this just shows that actually the ultimate decider on this and the buildings that were built there were the security professionals, right? And they came in and said, well, then you're going to have to have, you know, screening. You're going to have to have screening before people go to an underground space at Ground Zero. So, so, uh, and it's just, yeah, and then the families were like, we think going down below ground is the wrong meaning. It's too somber, right? So so one of the most important elements of the original design got basically designed out by committee. Let's move back underground. Um, <laughs> one, one exits the museum mm -hmm. by going through what has been described as uh, crass. And I think that's <laughs> that's one of the polite mentions of it. Um, and this is the the gift shop that has been mm -hmm. set up for the museum, which at least one family member, um, someone whose uh, firefighter son died at the World Trade Center on 9-11, said regarding the offensiveness of the, the gift shop um, when there are remains occupying the same overall space, he said, they're down there selling bracelets. They're making money off of my dead son. Mm -hmm. You can understand that feeling. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about the controversy over the gift shop and what steps, if any, the operators have taken to try to at least minimize the uncomfortable nature of, of having it in that space. Well, the selling of 9-11 souvenirs uh, happened very quickly, right? Uh, I think it was two weeks later, uh, there were lots of informal economy vendors set up in lower Manhattan around the periphery who were selling qu quickly reconfigured snow globes and teddy bears and other kinds of things. So so I think the urge to consume and images of the Twin Towers just flew off of postcard displays, right? So the urge to consume around the tragedy was very immediate. Uh, yeah. Then we have much more official kinds of stores. I mean, it was inevitable that this museum would have a gift shop, though there are around the world memory museums um, that choose not to do that or that choose to have, you know, just books and things. I, uh, recently, somebody told me the Holocaust Museum now sells T-shirts, but um, they didn't for a very yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot of people say, hey, this is what Americans do. We consume everything. Everything gets branded, right? Uh, and of course, the museum does this to raise money uh, because it is such an expensive museum to run. Um, but I, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that it it, it has been such a source of controversy, and especially initially, um, 
the New York Post uh, ran a huge headline that said Little Shop of Horrors, you know, visit site of death, buy a T-shirt, you know. So so um, uh, it and initially they had a couple items that were so uber crass that they had to remove them. And the most famous being the 9-11 cheese plate. Yeah. It was a yellow map of the United States with Ooh. three sites on it. Yeah, like how could they have possibly thought that was okay? At the right. at the other extreme, uh, mm-hmm. I know there are objects mm-hmm. there like uh, mugs and other things mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. incorporate the the scaffolding design, the outer columns right. of the original mm-hmm. World Trade Center yeah. to to evoke the towers, mm-hmm. but you know. <laughs> Not, not, not in the, the 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 shape, or not as a cheese plate, right? They mm-hmm. they're doing it in a way, and I wonder how that plays into something that you've identified in in some mm-hmm. of your work about the need that people have, mm-hmm. not just to see the world, the, the the two towers in a snow globe, but mm-hmm. to actually have an object right. from the site in order to take away meaning. This human mm-hmm. connection mm-hmm. to something that was there, which I witnessed decades ago when I was at Petra in Jordan, they didn't have a gift shop at the time. I presume they do now because they've built out a lot of the tourist infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But when I first went there, uh, there was nothing of the sort. And you routinely saw people climbing up above some of the architectural Mm -hmm. features of the the Nabataeans Mm -hmm. and digging around in the dirt Mm -hmm. and pulling out little shards of pottery. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to take that. But right. people had this need to to take an object away from a site of meaning to them. And this mm-hmm. site had meaning for people for various reasons. Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not a surprise to me that people who have the mm-hmm. experience of going through this museum and spending some time at the memorial feel the need to have something to connect with that site. Right. And that ends up somewhat crassly being the gift mm-hmm. shop. Right. Yeah, people have a desire that I think we should try to understand, right, to take things away from meaningful sites or to have objects that that sort of signal that they went to uh, a, a meaningful site. Sometimes that's about taking things to a meaningful site. At Oklahoma City, they have a fence, which they decided to keep, where people bring things from keep there there's a big sort of location keychain thing right. that people do yeah. there. So so I think that w- we want to look at those kinds of practices that people engage in to try and make sense of something like this. Um but I I also think that the that that border between sort of meaningful objects and kind of crass commercialism uh, is a thin one, and the museum often crosses it, right? So why is that? Well, uh, you know, the, the, they had consultants come in whose job it is is to teach museums how to make objects that they can sell. And and uh, and in the, the film The Outsider that was released in August, which talks about, which, they have a lot of footage of the negotiations going on in, in the museum, you see these people making presentations to the museum staff and you say, yeah, well, that's why it happened, right? Because, you know, let's create some dishware that looks like the original Twin Towers and or ties and, you know, and, and maybe people will buy that because they're nostalgic about the right. original Twin Towers. I mean, it, 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 there's a certain world in which that makes sense. And then once you see it on display, you just think, yeah, that cringe. That, what is that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there's an element of cringe also for many people <laughs> in another element, um, which involves what is you know called the Oculus and mm-hmm. uh, the atrium of the mm-hmm. Oculus underground near the transportation mm-hmm. hub, which was built to mm-hmm. to to allow the movement of traffic. Uh, unfortunately, mm-hmm. not above ground as in, intended for pedestrians, but underground. But this large atrium with a cathedral-like uh, awe aspect is actually above the shopping mall mm-hmm. and and not the transportation hub so it's not the cathedral effect of new yorkers coming together to and fro the the crossroads of this great mm-hmm. commercial capital um but instead it's it's celebrating the apple store and and other chain mm-hmm. stores <laughs> um what's the significance to you of that and how does it reflect the overall criticism of so much that has happened at ground zero that the power of it now the power of memorializing it 
is really more about real estate development and consumer culture than it is about national meaning. Yes, and then doesn't that sort of tell us something about uh, our values as a nation or maybe even as a city? Uh, yeah, I think the rebuilding of Lower Manhattan is uh, a, a f- tragic and expensive failure of imagination and for it to happen in a city like New York, which has extraordinary design professionals. Yeah, such creativity and, to tap into, yes, right? And creativity in other parts of the city, right? Uh, and of course, there's been a lot written about, you know, why it happened and how, but, but really we're talking about $25 billion, largely public funds, right? Uh, that built One World Trade Center and, and the Oculus. The Oculus clocked in at four billion dollars. It was two billion dollars over wow. over budget. Wow. And and um, and here, when when I talk about this in the book, I talk a lot about the sort of complicity of the culture of star architecture or star architecture in in uh, how a lot of this transgressed. So we have. This, I, these um, big name architects like Santiago Calatrava and um, uh, David Childs and D- Daniel Liebskin, and we have these buildings where there's a demand for symbolism, and that's a national demand for symbolism, right? And then the the there's a lot of mismanagement of budgets and the port authority, which really should be about infrastructure and not about building buildings is really out of control. I mean, there are all these things that go on. Right. And so the sense then that this was a squandering, not just a public money, but a public faith, right. Really began to emerge. And, and, um, and so the, the Oculus, which on the outside looks now like a kind of, strange insects sitting next to these tall buildings uh, ultimately becomes a kind of monument to the folly uh, of how we as a nation and our, certainly our government sort of threw money uh, yeah. at this and, um, and the way in which those forces, which have a lot to do with the power of real estate development and right. basically runs New York City, right? Yeah. And now I would just say, uh, as um, office people have been, companies have been deserting office space in Manhattan over the last two years, the folly of it looks even more so because um, we're going to have a lot of empty offices in buildings that were paid for by the public. Ironically, the area around ground zero almost becomes a de facto COVID memorial because of... (laughs) It's empty office spaces and it could end up (laughs) achieving an unintended and tragic dual purpose in, in that sense. Uh, It's, it's striking to me looking at the design of the exterior of this, the, um, Mm -hmm. the, you know, evoking a bird or an angel. If you plop that in the middle of (laughs) Ottumwa, Iowa or Rosemead, California, as we discussed, I I think Mm -hmm. it actually could be quite compelling. I think Mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting design, and it's one that does uh, it does drive some thought. Mm-hmm. But with the construction that has happened around it, mm-hmm. um, it loses that meaning because yeah. it 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 has minimized it to the sense that it it almost evokes a comical effect that mm-hmm. we know what you're trying to do there, <laughs> um, and it and it didn't work. So it almost creates a, a deeper meaning about those around it than about the object, uh, the construction itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And and the uh, it, initially it was greeted uh, with such rapture because it was seen sort of as its own building yeah. rather than in context. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and something that frankly was more interesting, design wise than mm-hmm. the uh, One World Trade Center, the Freedom right. Tower itself. Um, I have two two ways two two things to close with here, Marita, and, and thank you so much for this. This has been a really fascinating, uh, insightful conversation for for me. Uh, first, we've mentioned COVID a couple of times, and you mm-hmm. dropped earlier on that given the magnitude and the hundreds of thousands of deaths, um, that this is something that 
could call for a memorial. Mm -hmm. What are your ideas? Because mm -hmm. to me, I think it's extraordinarily hard. It's it's not mm -hmm. something akin to the AIDS quilt, although it is, mm -hmm. you know, obviously more mm -hmm. you know medical than terrorist oriented. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also not not enough. Like there's no close parallel to me for any memorial that we do have. Mm -hmm to know what would be an appropriate and tasteful way mm -hmm. of memorializing it um, while also imparting some meaning about the causes and the implications. So I'm not tasking you with the, the full <laughs> design and the construction, mm -hmm. but what thoughts occur to you in terms of how would a, a society that had the ability to do so coherently, which I do question now, mm -hmm. but how would a society that had the ability to collectively look at this issue what are the factors they would take into account when choosing how to memorialize something like the COVID-19 mm -hmm. epidemic? I think that one of the things that we should keep in mind always with memorialization is that we can't do it when we're in it, right? And that actually when it's rushed, it often fails, right? Um, and I, I, I think it's an enormous task to think about. There, there is an interesting project being run by some of my colleagues now it, called the Zip Code Project in, in New York, which has a lot to do with memorializing those who died of. I haven't COVID heard of that. What, what in, is the, the what are the city. contours of that? Uh, they're doing a lot of neighborhood workshops and storytelling and memorializing at a kind of local level, right? So the question is, what would, I guess the way I would respond is, what would a memorial about the pandemic, what would it do, right? So many people have died around the world, right? What would we want such a memorial to do? Besides saying that, you know, we, we recognize it, it, the loss, right? Um, would there be certain kinds of lessons that we would learn from that? You can see all of the dilemmas that might go into what a project like that could do and what it couldn't do. Right. right. And we have so much to learn from this pandemic. We have so much to learn about how we treat each other in a society. We have so much to learn about the role of government um, and what it means to, to take care of its citizens, right? Um, maybe a memorial can't teach us that, but maybe it could help us help those who are mourning to feel that there's a collective mourning. Um, so I would say, there's a lot of questions about what, even before we might get to something like design and where mm -hmm. about yeah, what, what are we even what trying to, mm -hmm. to do with mm -hmm. it? Fair mm -hmm. questions all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have what I hope will be a fair question for you here, <laughs> here on chatter. We, we have the uh, so-called chatter mm -hmm. box where we have mm -hmm. a bunch of random questions mm -hmm. that are pre-printed and we just pull one out <laughs> and ask our guests to answer as a closing item. Who is someone in your field or a related one mm -hmm. whose work more people should be following? Well, I'm, I'm going to say, because you're uh, down there in D.C., that uh, one of the people whose work on memory in the United States, I think, is um, really important is Alison Landsberg. Um, okay. teaches at uh, GMU and and um, uh, and who writes a lot about um, her most important concept is about prosthetic memory, the way in we, which we use sort of media things to act as a prosthesis for our memory. And huh. she's doing some very interesting work now about what she calls post racial, post post racial forms of memory mm -hmm. uh, and looking a lot at popular culture and ways in which uh, race inflects um, many cultural product projects today in terms of what we're remembering. Well, we um, will include a 
a link to her work <laughs> in the show notes because we, mm -hmm. we appreciate the shout out mm -hmm. and we, we like the idea of expanding people's horizons and that will certainly be true here. Uh, Marita, thank you for your thank you. generous time you've given us right. and opening our eyes to so many aspects of this. And uh, we appreciate you joining us on Chatter. Yeah, and I'm, I want to congratulate you on your starting this podcast that wants to connect culture to these other issues of national security. I think it's very innovative and good luck. We'll do what we can. Thank you. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.